Today, what we're going to look at is the Catholic Church and the American Civil War, the Second Civil War, the Revolution being the first, the war between the states, war of the rebellion, brothers' war, war of northern aggression, war of southern independence. All these names have been given to that conflict, which from 1861 to 1865 killed more Americans than all the other wars we have fought combined. And many of those deaths were civilian deaths. That's something we should allow to sink in for a number of reasons. The first thing we really need to look at is the causes of the war and where the church and the country were. The frequent uh, idea today that the war was all about slavery. The North was fighting a glorious crusade to free the enslaved blacks from the clutches of the evil Southerners. That's the Northern view. The Southern view, of course, was that it had absolutely nothing to do with slavery and was all about states' rights. State sovereignty is guaranteed in the Constitution. And uh, the uh, desire of the North to dominate and ultimately destroy the South. Others would look to different explanations. The idea that it was a conflict between the northern uh, emergent industrial banking complex versus the southern agricultural elites, the uh, part of the age-old struggle between the, uh, the Celts of the south and the Anglos of the north, it was one thing and another. Well, the truth is that there's truth in all of these uh, altogether. There's a certain amount of truth in each of them. Certainly, from the time that they were settled uh, under the British, the North and the South were different places. And so the factories of the North were primarily staffed by people fresh off the boat from Ireland and Germany. Um, many of these were Catholic, but more of that momentarily. As slavery and the slave trade uh, grew increasingly less profitable in New England and the North, New England and the North became more and more abolitionist. Uh, this was interesting because the slave trade was carried on entirely by New England ships, the southern states not really having much of a fleet, uh, until 1808, when slavery became illegal, uh, sorry, not slavery, but uh, rather when the importation of slaves from Africa became illegal by the Constitution. Uh, it was New England that benefited primarily from the slave trade. They would. Uh, sell Bibles and guns and rum on the west coast of Africa and exchange them for slaves, which they would take to the south and bring the cash money that they got in the south up north. As uh, slavery became, as I say, less profitable for the north, it was more and more considered an outrage. And by the 1830s, abolitionism, the uh, Immediate abolition of slavery in the South became a great talking point of the North. Who actually succeeded to the sovereignty of the king in 1783? The federal government or the sovereign states? Now, it seems like an easy answer to some. The uh, states pre-existed the federal government. But it wasn't that easy, any more than it is today. Um, in those days, too, remember that the Senate was not popularly elected. The senators were chosen by the different state governments. And so the Senate acted as sort of the state's watchdog on the federal government, which, of course, it does no longer today. Uh, this was why the uh, question of how many slave states versus how many free states became a big, a big issue. The other, the other question was whether or not states had the right to secede if they were unhappy with the way things the federal were being done by the federal government. We think of secession as a primarily Southern issue. But interestingly enough, my native state of New York only signed the Constitution on the assurance that they could secede if it was pro a problem later on. In 1814, during the uh, War of 1812, which ruined New England's trade uh, temporarily, the New England states sent delegates to the town of Hartford, Connecticut, the Hartford Convention, which very seriously discussed the secession of the New England states from the Union. 
uh, the War of 1812 being seen as primarily an issue for the South and the West. Now, slavery itself had led to a great deal of conflict amongst religious people. And in the decades coming uh, before the Civil War, when it became an increasingly hot button issue, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, and the Baptists all split. Northern Presbyterians, Southern Presbyterians, Northern Methodists, Southern Methodists, Northern Baptists, Southern Baptists. Eventually, the Methodists and the Presbyterians would reunite after the war, decades later. The Baptists never did, which is why you still have the Southern Baptist Convention and what was originally the Northern Baptist Convention, but it's now called the American Baptist Churches. Anyway, the Catholic Church and the Episcopal Church, the two other major national churches at the time, did not split over slavery. But the Catholics, and this is kind of important to bear in mind for what, what uh, we would end up doing during that war, the Catholics were very unevenly distributed as they are today. In the northern uh, industrial areas, in New England and in the, uh, New York, Pennsylvania, uh, out into Chicago, there were many, particularly Irish in those days, immigrants, uh, who had come to work in factories and the railroads and so on. There were a lot of them. But they didn't really count for a lot politically. Nevertheless, they had, in the decades leading up to the Civil War, had had to put up with a great deal of discrimination, the Know Nothing movement, and so on. At the time the war broke out, they uh, had in the North some interesting uh, leadership, especially John Hughes, the Archbishop of New York, Dagger John, as he was called. There were a number of very interesting Catholic laymen who were converts. Uh, Arrestus Bronson in New England, who had been a transcendentalist. Uh, McMaster in New York. Further south, in Maryland, uh, there were still a lot of Catholics whose roots lay in English colonial times, uh, as were in Kentucky. Mr. Justice Tawney of the Supreme Court, who uh, uh, had been the uh, fellow by the Dred Scott decision, he was a Catholic from Maryland, and they had a certain social cachet in that part of the world, as they did in Kentucky. Further south, you would see a lot of Catholics, uh, primarily in the seaports, places like Savannah, Charleston, a lot of French refugees from the uh, revolts of the Caribbean. St. Augustine, Florida, Pensacola, Florida, Spanish descendants. A lot of uh, French Catholics along the Gulf Coast in Mobile, Biloxi, southern Louisiana. Spanish and Mexican Catholics in uh, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and of course in California. In California, however, you were having an awful lot of immigrants from Europe and all over the, the uh, country because of the gold rush, which was a mere 11 years before the war would begin. The Union uh, strategy for defeating the South required basically cutting it up into pieces. So after Admiral Farragut took the city of New Orleans, uh, the Union Army moved north. While they were in St. Martinville, they used the, uh, they used the uh, priest of the parish of St. Martin as uh, a target. Uh, at the elevation, they, one of the Union soldiers shot at him. Uh, when he was elevating the host to mass, but he missed. So uh, that was that was all right. Uh, but they pushed north along the Mississippi. The um, uh, other the uh, northern uh, troops further north pushed south. Eventually, they came together at Vicksburg, where there was a major siege. And when Vicksburg fell, the south was effectively cut in two. Uh, the same strategy would be worked with uh, the great push through in Tennessee, the Battle of Shiloh, the burning of Atlanta, Sherman's march to the sea, and the South was then cut in three. As uh, earlier mentioned, the Union uh, strategy for defeating the South required basically cutting it up into pieces. So after Admiral Farragut took the city of New Orleans, uh, the Union Army moved north. While they were in St. Martinville, they used the, uh, they used the uh, priest of the parish of St. Martin as uh, a target. Uh, at the elevation, they, one of the 
Union soldier shot at him uh, when he was elevating the host to mass, but he missed. So uh, that was that was all right. But they pushed north along the Mississippi. The um, uh, other the uh, northern uh, troops further north pushed south. Eventually, they came together at Vicksburg, where there was a major siege. And when Vicksburg fell, the South was effectively cut in two. The same strategy would be worked with uh, the great push through in Tennessee, the Battle of Shiloh, the burning of Atlanta, Sherman's march to the sea, and the South was then cut in three. And eventually, in 1865, they surrendered. President Davis was put into prison at a place called Fortress Monroe. While he was there, Pope Pius IX sent him a picture of himself with the inscription, come to me all you who labor and are heavy, uh, heavy burden, to a letter assuring Davis of his personal regard and support. Fortunately for Jefferson Davis, he was released eventually and would move to Biloxi, Mississippi, where you can still see his home at Beauvoir. Lincoln, who was very, very much against punishing the southern states after the war was over, his major interest was simply reuniting the country, and he had no uh, no desire to victimize or villainize the South. Quite the contrary, as he said in his famous uh, with charity to all and malice toward none speech. Unfortunately for the South, as we all know, he was shot and killed at Ford's Theater. The radical Republicans took over, and they imposed the regime of reconstruction on the South. Now, this did several things. On the one hand, took away the the right of those who uh, had served the Southern uh, government in any capacity to vote or to uh, bear witness or press charges in court, which basically meant they were deprived of all their civil rights. So the South was uh, ruled by a coalition of blacks who now could vote, recently freed, uh, northern uh, carpetbaggers, as they were called, and southern scalawags, as the southerners who cooperated with the uh, occupiers were called. Business went back to usual as far as the church was concerned. The Episcopal Church had split in two just because of the war. They reunited very quickly. The Catholic Church had never exactly split in any case because we were not a national church in that sense. The work of Reconstruction was carried on in several different ways. The Freedmen's Bureau uh, was organized, which was designed to help the ex-slaves learn how to be, you might have guessed, free men, which required a certain amount of education. Unfortunately, one of those bits of education was the attempt to lure Catholic blacks in Louisiana and other Gulf states away from the Catholic Church and into various Protestants. This was in keeping with the um, Union uh, post-war policy, which led to the um, turning over of two-thirds of the Catholic Indian uh, mission stations in the West uh, by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and they're being turned over to Protestant ministers. There was a great deal of anti-Catholicism in the Grant administration. and. Uh, That was seen both in their dealings with the blacks and their dealings with the Indians. However, all of that having been said, under the Reconstruction regime, Father Ryan wrote many of his saddest poems. A number of uh, Catholic converts like Sidney Lanier uh, came from the ranks of Confederate writers and artists. And eventually, when the Northerners realized that they needed uh, when the, when the uh, Republicans realized that they needed Southern votes, a gentleman's agreement was made to end Reconstruction. But after the generation that had made the deal uh, died off and were replaced by those who had grown up during Reconstruction, they came up with ingenious ways to uh, disenfranchise the blacks. And the regime of Jim Crow of segregation gradually came in. Interesting that the Francophone Catholic blacks of Southern Louisiana mounted a uh, uh, 
offense against this, a legal offense. Omer Plessis, who is a French-speaking Catholic black from New Orleans, was the main plaintiff in Plessy versus Ferguson, which was an attempt to defeat segregation on the railroads. In 1896, the Supreme Court found against him, and so segregation became the law of the land, so long, the court said, as facilities were separate but equal. During the Jim Crow period, the church did everything it could to assist the growth of Catholic institutions, especially in Maryland, Louisiana, and to a degree in Virginia. So in, uh, in Virginia, there was a, uh, a Catholic military academy, uh, specifically for blacks. There was a the Xavier University in New Orleans. And in Maryland and Louisiana, where Catholicism was the strongest, the Archdiocese of Baltimore and New Orleans fought and lost uh, lawsuits against their respective state governments to um, avoid having segregation imposed upon their institutions. As I say, they lost. And so, while on the one hand, uh, the Catholic Church did everything it could to encourage the uh, growth of black Catholic institutions amongst the South, and while we have not one, not two, not three, but five uh, Catholic, or four rather, Catholic candidates for sainthood coming from that era, uh, Toussaint comes from the pre-Civil War era, and uh, Sister Thea Bowman from our own period, in throughout the South, you would see uh, either separate black parishes or separate times for black and white congregations. Usually, though, this did not mean that blacks couldn't go to masses for whites and vice versa. Rather, it meant that if you were white and you went to a mass for blacks, you sat in the back and vice versa. When the Knights of Columbus arose, it became popular in the South. But in those days, the South had, or the uh, Knights, rather, had a rule called the Black Ball Rule, which meant that if an individual was being considered for membership in a, in a council, the vote of one person could uh, keep that person out. Well, as you might figure, in the South, you could almost always find one person to vote to keep a black candidate out. The result of that in 1894, I believe, was the founding of the Knights of Peter Claver, a, uh, a similar fraternal order to the Knights of Columbus, specifically for Catholic blacks, uh, an organization to which I have the honor to belong. But the truth must be told that Reconstruction and Jim Crow poisoned and continue to poison racial relationships in this country. Um, the attempts of people like General Beauregard and Bedford Forrest to uh, bridge the racial gap were not well received in their time and are completely forgotten in ours. As we know, uh, in recent years, the uh, attacks on Confederate statues, which uh, gathered momentum after the uh, riots in 2020 have become a commonplace in uh, national life. They've extended, of course, to attacking all sorts of statues, including those of Father Junipero Serra in California. But a word has to be said about those commemorations. Despite the poisoned racial relations that ensued from Reconstruction and Jim Crow. By and large, the reconciliation between North and South happened very, very quickly, especially considering the enormous body count and the huge devastation the war, the war, uh, the war created. 50 years after the Battle of Gettysburg, a mere 50 years, they had a reunion with Confederate and Union veterans. They, the Confederate veterans relived Pickett's Charge, ran down the hill into the arms of the Union veterans. Part of the price of that reconciliation was that both Union and Confederates, 
were allowed to honor their dead, their heroes. And in fact, Memorial Day, Decoration Day as it was called, came about because Southern ladies uh, began decorating the graves of Union troops buried in the South who had no one to look after them. Let's hope that as Catholics were able to reconcile after the war, there'd be a racial reconciliation as well. Certainly that's something the church in America and St. Uh, Catherine Drexel worked for. 